Good morning, I'm Bruce Pyanson, and this is the first of two sessions today that I will be hosting. And they're both about population health and about how thoracic health fits in or doesn't yet fit in with population health efforts. Uh, QIW sessions are all about measurement, quantification, and the kind of quantification we're going to be talking about and, and our, our guests are going to be talking about is a bit different than what uh, others are here, but it's all measurement. We're going to be talking about the key elements of, of on a grand scale across thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, how the health of populations gets affected and changed. And as we've seen in recent years, there's a, a huge focus on public health and population health outcomes. This is taking the form of concerns over the overly high expenditures on healthcare and the, the unaffordability of healthcare, as well as the outcomes of healthcare, which in the US are certainly less and worse than uh, most other countries. Uh, I will say most of this conversation is US centric, although population health is the universal concept. We, we have three speakers this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome back Mary Barton, uh, who's from the National Committee on Quality Assurance, one of the most important, if not the most important organization for population health measurement in the United States. Uh, my colleague, Corey Gusselin, who's an actuary and uh, who will be speaking about accountable care organizations and the kinds of measurements and quantification and financial and modeling that goes on as accountable care organizations choose what to do or what to not do. And the last speaker this morning is Spencer Cariuchu, who had been with the Center, the Medicare Innovation Center, uh, overseeing new models of accountable care. And he's going to talk about how the Medicare program views these uh, kinds of population health programs. Well, I've created a straw dog uh, to, to center of uh, uh, these conversations. And the straw dog is, it starts with the concept that implementing widespread lung cancer screening will have large health benefits for the at-risk population, smokers and ex-smokers. Uh, and so those benefits include identifying lung cancer at a curable stage, as well as diagnosing COPD and cardiac conditions earlier and other benefits. And this, the question is, will provider organizations or communities be willing to take risk for successfully implementing these programs on a grand scale in their populations? In other words, would they put their money where their mouth is? So that's the straw dog. Um, uh, what does taking risk for lung cancer screening outcomes mean? Well, here's a few things it means. It means reaching a target for the percentage of people that should be, that get screened. Today, it's around five or 6%. It's, it's terribly low, as we all know. Another uh, goal is reaching a target for uh, an outcomes metric, such as the portion of incident lung cancers that are screened detected, as opposed to symptomatically or incidentally detected. Another outcome is reducing the spending on lung cancer uh, treatment for a defined population. For example, the state of Delaware. Uh, another outcome is reporting the results on what led to success or failure. And finally, having an organization, perhaps a hospital-based or a physician-based organization or a governmental organization, taking risk for these outcomes, being accountable. Well, Medicare, Medicare program has taken the lead in, in these programs. There's about 60 million beneficiaries, 60 million people in the United States covered by the federal Medicare program. Most are over 65, some are not. And population health 
in Medicare takes two forms. About 24 million to the 60 million people are covered by Medicare Advantage plans. These are private insurers that take risk for financial outcomes as well as quality outcomes for the 24 million uh, beneficiaries that that enroll. There's another 12 million people that are not in Medicare Advantage, but are enrolled in accountable care organizations. So uh, if you have the, the 24 and the 12, that's most Medicare beneficiaries are in a form of accountable care and population health. Well, uh, here's a brief history. This is a, uh, a well-established program if under a lot of change. The first program's Pioneer started in 2012. Next Generation ACOs started in 2016. And this year, direct contracting entities have, have expanded. So the, there's a lot of history here and a lot of well-established processes. And we'll be hearing this afternoon from a leader of one of the successful ACOs and how they do it. So what is a Medicare ACO? Well, it's an organization and it's a group of providers that deliver care to fee-for-service beneficiaries. And if they meet certain criteria, they can generate a bonus payment. And that might be uh, 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 savings or quality outcomes or a combination of both. The beneficiaries are attributed to the ACO based on a plurality of visits to certain providers associated with the ACO, typically primary care. And members might not even know they're, they're associated with the ACO. The bottom line, the bottom line of this slide is the ACO is accountable for managing the healthcare costs for their members and other outcomes. And that's measured. It's not uh, hand-waving. There's uh, well-defined metrics for that. Well, why do these uh, ACOs exist? Uh, the goal is to get better value for the money that Medicare spends, reducing the inefficiencies, having the providers focus on value instead of volume, and saving money for the beneficiaries, uh, the providers, and the Medicare program as a whole. Um, so the Innovation Center has been key in sponsoring innovative programs and pilot programs, and they have the authority to actually implement these without going back to Congress to implement them on a national scale. And what they typically need is to find populations. Um, uh, they can provide administrative support and typically do for these kind of innovations, set up again law sharing arrangement. Um, they'll sometimes provide startup type funding and they'll do the measurements. So back to the straw dog, does it make sense for advocates, including folks in this room, in this virtual room, to attempt a thoracic health pilot through the through CMMI, through the Innovation Center. And here's a, a, just a bit of context. Um, there's perhaps, round terms, 10 million beneficiaries who ought to be getting lung cancer screening. Almost none of them get it today. If we were, if the cost of doing a, a scan is about $300, and by the way, the cost of the scan is far and away the biggest cost in a screening program. Uh, then there's about $2.4 billion potential spending if we actually screened 80% of those 10 million. That's a really ambitious goal. Put, it, put that into context, Medicare spends about $800 billion a year. So lung cancer screening, at least the biggest component of it, is about 0.3% of Medicare spending. Is this big enough for people to bother? People in this room think lung cancer screening, thoracic health is important. So uh, clearly we need to put the numbers together to demonstrate what the value is. Well, uh, back to our speakers. Uh, we'll, we'll connect afterwards and Anita McLaughlin from uh, uh, GoTo Foundation will be getting your questions and we'll be talking again in a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, Bill.